Hey, what's up guys? <laughs> it's <laughs> I'm so glad we got to go uh, today because we got to meet everybody, so it doesn't feel like nerve-wracking at all to be up here, which is really great. So thanks for that, Drew. Um, so I'm Amy, this is Jen. We're from Hutzpah Design Co., which is in Newport Beach, California. So Newport's in Orange County, which um, I guess we're known for our export crops, which are Botox and yoga pants. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Close third is uh, mobile spray tanning booths. That too. Yeah. And uh, it's a good place, though. It's um, we live. It's a peninsula, like totally like this, touristy and fair food and lots of bars, and it's it's really awesome. Um, so we thought we would start out by contextualizing ourselves. Um, so we live in a really voyeuristic culture right now. So um, here's a little bit of our backstory from the very beginning. So we are literal mutants, according to science books. Twins are. And we were born on Halloween, two months early. Uh, we were supposed to be born on Christmas, so bad omens all around, really, for our mother. Um, but yeah, we came out two months early looking like two-pound gremlins. And I'm really glad that our mom didn't just like abandon us to nuns, really, because uh, that would have been really terrible. But thanks, Mom. We're still here. Um, but yeah, we grew up in California. We spent a lot of time in boxes like cats. And um, according to the photos, we just made out all the time. So. <laughs> I think that must have been at my mom's beckoning because we don't do that anymore no. now that we don't live with her. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, yeah, it might be appealing if we weren't underaged and balding, but yeah, anyways. So that was California and uh, we had to take a trip. That's what our mom called it when we moved. We realized we were taking a trip to uh, Wisconsin and then we took another trip to New York where we grew up and spent a, a really awesome snowy childhood. Um, yeah, so look at those teeth by the way. <laughs> we had braces for like five years. Yeah. It, anyway. it still didn't work, actually. Yeah. yeah. But um, we were double mint gum sticks for Halloween, and our mom was always super encouraging of us being creative and artistic, and uh, the snow melted our costumes. Uh, water based inks are a bitch, right? Okay. Yeah. They always turn on you. But, anyways, uh, yeah, we were growing up in New York at this school, and uh, there was this mandatory lunch club called um, Banana Splits, which was really misleading. It was for divorced uh, people of divorced parents. But it was really misleading because they never gave you dessert. It was just like a, a fun name, I guess. But all it really was was just us and a bunch of other troubled, troubled kids, I guess, um, standing on our desks singing Gangster's Paradise. Um, and we begged our mom for cornrows, like Julio. And all she could really do was just give us her signature like mile-high bang treatment, which I think close. was pretty close. It's pretty close. It, she did her best. <laughs> And then we took another trip to Kentucky, where my grandma lives. Yeah, so we moved in with my grandma, and uh, she lives on this awesome farm with like horses and chickens. And so when we weren't cleaning horse stalls, um, we were drawing, and we were writing musicals, and we were really weird, and we tried to write screenplays, and you know, we drew our own Christmas cards that we inevitably sent out at Valentine's Day. And it was just really fun. It was a really fun place to grow up. And Kentucky's awesome because like our high school, the future farmers, of America Club was like the popular kids club. Like that was the cool kids. And they would have tractor poles and like keg parties at the river. That was not a school funded thing. Um, and it was just really fun. And it was like a Brad Paisley music video. So it was a good place to grow up. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> during that phase in our life, we were like totally into emo. So it was like really handy that our mom made us take violin and cello for like seven years as kids because all of our friends were in these really sad. Uh, bands that needed sad strings, so we like really made a killing uh, at that time. And when we were playing with our friends in their emo bands, my uncle Owen had this family bluegrass band, and uh, we would play at the local Baptist church every week for their potluck. And you guys think that Amy's dribble account is impressive, but you haven't seen anything until you've seen her just sawing away on a gospel hymn while old people are like fighting over chicken livers at the at the table. It, it was amazing. So. But um, we went through like a small spiritual crisis. We wanted to kind of know what our purpose was. We weren't really sure if we had any meaning. Um, so we kind of heeded the call of manifest destiny that calls us all out westward at some point in our lives, or at least us good ones. <coughs> and um, we moved back in with our dad in California. So we were so context clueless when we moved to California. Like in Kentucky, everyone's friendly and it's a really small town. So we, we moved to a school where our class, just our class, was like a thousand people. And nobody even knew that we were new. Like, so we had, and we just hadn't done the research or the recon to know that like New Balance wasn't cool here and we should have had rainbow sandals and all this stuff. So moving around a ton just, it really taught us the importance of context and like being able to like adapt to your situations. So 
it was just really hard for us to autocorrect at first, and we're not sure if it was like our creepy southern hospitality, or if it was like the Stephen King like twin vibes, or like what it was. Um, but anyway, art was like a really great way for us to like stand out, so we decided we were going to major in art. So what we realized really, really quickly was that like you don't make a living at art. If at least the art that we were making was not selling. <laughs> so um, to be a true artist, like you have to be resolved to be eating like top ramen and watching Game of Thrones through your neighbor's window. So we were not cut out for that life. So we decided we would do the next best thing. So we were like, yay, let's be designers. Like, we'll just like make really cool band posters all day and just get paid like mad money for it. We'll just like swim in gold coins like Scrooge McDuck and just like love our lives. Um, so we thought we would go into design. We took it in college and then we came to a rude awakening when we got our first job at this print magazine um, in college. So we realized then that most of the time a designer is just like some guy in a cubicle in Irvine making 50% off clipper ads for like Botox. So that's what we were doing. <laughs> um, so it was like a really rude awakening, but it was also like the best first job we could have had because we learned that um, every opportunity gives you a chance to learn. And so we learned what not to do, and it was just the, fir the best first job. So like our art director, he was like a, a meth head, like Steve Miller band loving, like awesome dude. And he just taught us how to work really rough, really fast, and just get it done, and it was awesome. Yeah. He also taught us every word to the Joker. Like, he just had it on repeat, that song. It's awful. Um, but anyways, so we slowly learned that, like, designers are really just about solving problems. And, of course, the, uh, the magazine folded. Yeah, so the, ma the print industry took a hit, and the magazine folded. And so instead of, like, looking for opportunities, because on paper, we weren't that hireable. We didn't go to school. Um, we only had three years' experience. And so we started Hudspa Design Co. It was, it was kind of like necessity was a mother of invention. And just to give you an idea of uh, what we did, here's a quick little montage. <laughs> That was just the best way to really like fade it out at like a, a reasonable point. Um, you guys don't know how hard it was to put a slideshow that like matched the beat um, to that song because like uh, their drummer is just like whack. The 4-4 timing was just like sped up, slowed down, sped up. It, I just gave up in the end. But uh, we'll be giving stuff away throughout. Does anybody know who the lead singer of that band was? Maybe him? No? <laughs> Lemmy? You. You get a t-shirt later. Okay. Um, the ones we're wearing. Yeah, but anyways, let's, let's suggest to them a, a ghost drummer on their next album if they ever make one. Um, so context. We've all heard that content is king, but if content is king, then definitely context is queen. And if there's anything that we've learned from gay sitcom characters, it's that queens are like way taller and way more exciting than kings. So, um, <laughs> so basically this talk is about design Darwinism. It's kind of like our intro said, like, um, adapting to the context of your situation. Um, it's survival of the fittest, right? Um, and the fittest are those who know how to adapt. Um, adapting is being able to know how to respond to changing context. And that doesn't necessarily mean conforming. It's not like a Grease, you know, Olivia Newton-John makeover all the time. Um, it's just adapting according to changing context, and it's a skill that applies to everything in life. It's not just design, it's business, it's relationships. It's, it's really important. And it affects everything. It's, it's culture, it's society, it's the world, it's styles, it's business. Everything's changing, and if, if you're not keeping up, you're going to get left behind. And it's funny, because we like to reference our aunt in this. Like, when you lose context of just changing styles and things, you end up like my aunt. She's still teasing her bangs to high heaven and rocking a Hillary pantsuit like the 90s never died. 
and she got left behind, and people make fun of her, and I don't want to be that person, so. <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> so mean. Uh, we love you, Aunt, if you're watching. We love I, you. Gosh, yeah, Aunt Joni, you're the best. Okay. Um, <laughs> but it just goes to show how important context is, because you could have the same exact players. You could have cars, cop cars, and regular cars, but in two different contexts, it's a completely different meaning. So if the cops are in front of you, you're somebody important, like the president, or maybe the pope, or maybe you're in a parade. But if the cops are behind you, you're in a white Bronco, and let's just hope you have Johnny Cochran on speed dial, you know? So um, same exact players, but completely different contexts. Another context. Um, if you're a rich, powerful leader from Britain, then in America, you get your own uh, style watch like, blog in Us Weekly, and we're like obsessed with you. But if you're a rich, powerful leader from Russia, Where is it? Sorry. Fail. <laughs> um, and that's not even right or wrong, it's just context. Like, from Russian's perspective, or that area of the world, maybe uh, Prince William is a weirdo and ugly, <laughs> you know, because he's super sexy and wrestles bears. But it just, goes to share, it just goes to show that, like, depending on where you're from, you might get an Us Weekly column or you might not, I don't know. Um, but same exact hair, look at that. Same exact pallid complexion, same exact like thin upper lip, but completely different perceptions. Another great example is Bill Clinton. Yeah, you can see that. So like in 1998, he was like the biggest pervert around. Everybody hated him. Like you didn't want to be associated with him at all. And then you go flash forward to now, and people are like traveling far and wide, like groveling at his feet, kissing his rings, trying to get him to back their ticket. He's like a democratic demigod now. And nothing's changed about him, really. He's the same person, but the context has changed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this one's our favorite. So this is like, okay, so we live in Newport, like I said. And it's a lot like this. Like, you guys, anybody who went out to Firehouse, which was like all of you, um, you guys saw, like, the, the kind of people that live around here. It, they're really mellow, and it's like, but it's like kind of aggressive at the bars, right? So um, th there's the context to bikes in Newport. If you're riding a bike on the boardwalk, a beach cruiser bike on the boardwalk, um, and you have like a surfboard or you're like in swim trunks, like you're cool, you're laid back, you're a local. You're doing it for fun. It's for fun. Yeah. But if you are riding a, be a beach cruiser on Harbor Boulevard, like with like four lanes of traffic this way, four lanes of traffic that way, and you're not wearing one of those like cycling unitards, this is a red flag for a guy that has a DUI. Yeah. It, it, I mean, if you're going long distance and on a bike on a cruiser beach and you cruiser. have like groceries, like you can always tell, you know, that is not for fun. That's like necessity. And they really wish that you couldn't see them. There yeah. was a bike pass somewhere else, but. <laughs> Anyways. It's Orange County, we're like a society of cars, so that's not everywhere, but that's where we are. Yeah, just where we are. In New York, it's totally normal to, to carry your groceries on your bike, yeah. <clears throat> but, simply put. Yeah, context determines the meaning of things. And if you can be aware and just not stay just solely in your own little world of yourself, then you can pick up on those little clues and help really read between the lines on what people are presenting and really see what maybe is actually happening so that you can better work with them, better deal with them. And you can also control the context on how people define and perceive you by being aware of the signals you're putting out and how people are contextualizing you. So Jen and I like to do, we've just realized how important this is in design mainly, like these last couple years. And um, we like to do client discoveries um, for, our, for our projects. And um, there's this really great documentary called uh, The Fog of War. Um, and it, I keep, I've like told like five people already to go watch it, but it's on Netflix and it's on Instant Watch and it won an Oscar, so you should watch it. <laughs> but um, I'm not getting paid to say that. And uh, it's basically they interview Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense during uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and Vietnam War, right? And um, they ask him the 11 things that he would have done differently um, looking back now that he's out of the fog of war. And his number one lesson was empathy, empathize with your enemy. And it's, I mean, sometimes the clients do seem like the enemy, right? But, or like even you, the clients, your boss or your company, right? Um, but they're not. And you just, that empathy, it goes, it goes miles. Like you have to meet everybody where they're at and you have to be able to see the perspective of a lot of different angles. So the best communicators are the ones that can, can look at a person, stand in their shoes and meet that person where they're at and make that connection. Um, the best problem solvers are able to see the, the problem from all the different angles and perceive like the problems before they come. So empathy is, it's just like context. It's just like Jeff had said, it's perspective. Um, and it's really important in relationships, in design, in everything. Um, it's open-mindedness. 
So yeah, but to, to have empathy, um, you have to really understand your audience, right? So um, you have to know what they want, um, what they need. Maybe those are two different things. Um, and you have to do a lot of research and a lot of digging. But we always like to collect this client discovery with the client before we even start the project. And first of all, we always remind them of the scope and limitations of, of the project. Um, we'll do a quick outline of you know, um, what the main project goal is, um, how many iterations they get, what the deliverables are, um, the time frame, kill fees, who's the main li liaison who gets you know, approval rights, um, and we'll put it in a nice little PDF um, with the following things and make sure that we all agree on it before we move forward. And this is something really cool that you guys probably know this guy, Mark Hemion. I like to call him uh, Mr. Big Shot Google guy because uh, he works for Google and he works for YouTube and he just, to me, he like knows everything. So I always ask him for his opinion. And we were asking him for advice on this, um, this thing we had been building, another social network for a client because we need another one. And, uh, and we were like, hey, like, what do you think about this like, user interface? And like, you know, like, what do you think, do you, does it make sense? And he's like, well, first of all, what's the atomic particle? And basically, what the atomic particle is, it's like the most simplified, honed-in um, purpose uh, for your project. And everything, like all the functionalities that are on the side of your project, you have to throw them against that atomic particle. And if it doesn't add to that purpose, if it takes away, you have to ditch it. And that was the rule. And we always thought that that was a really great way to keep clients on task, is to have us all agree at the beginning on the atomic particle and just get that established at the very beginning. And put it in writing. And put it in writing. <laughs> and then you say, when they want to go off the reservation, they want to add all this stuff in the middle, you say, hey, does that like meet our first goal, the atomic particle? Then it's probably not necessary. Like Maybe we can roll that out in like a second edition or something. But it's good to keep them on track and, and not getting off the reservation. Um, the next thing we like to do is like define the language and the terms. Like I think Kim was talking about it, but their idea of clean is always your different idea of clean, you know? So we, we like to back it up with mood boards and, and put it all in a PDF, like I said, so that we can all agree going in what these things mean and make sure we're on the same page. And we also do that with the, the language. Like we realized that we were building these functionalities and we were using terminology from other like sites to describe them, and we were all getting really confused as to what we were talking about. And so we started make, like, okay, this this is a dictionary for this project. We all have to use these terms, and it's probably really obvious to you guys. But anyway, this is our experience. Yeah, we just like to put it in a nice little packet that they agree to and they have. And then obviously you got to define the target audience, and and so. We like to say, like, we like to figure out, okay, like, what's your existing audience? Like, are you looking for a new audience? Um, like, are you trying to court new people? And what's the context of those people? Um, like, we have to study their patterns, kind of like a robber, like, casing a joint. Like, figure out, like, where they're going to be, what they're going to do, and, and then, you know, figure out how to meet them where they're at from there. And um, think like they do so that we can um, make what they like instead of what they dislike. And it's kind of cool, like you can use context, you can control it to your benefit, right? So another way to do that, which is kind of weird, is setting schedules and benchmarks. If you set like little benchmarks that are like little easy targets to hit, I feel like clients get excited about like, oh, we finished that thing, instead of thinking, oh, like we have all this stuff to work on, like this looming deadline. So we like to try and control like the context of everything to make the project feel like it's moving along and everything's going smoothly and all that good stuff. Yeah, so if everybody understands the, expect, the context of the project and they've all agreed on it, then it's just more likely that by the end of the project, they're going to have managed expectations because you're both on the same page and you've both agreed in both verbal terms and visual terms on what the goals are and, and what everybody's expecting. Because the minute you take things out of context or leave out context, it can get like really, people can get really, um, I don't know, annoyed or feel like they got a, sold a, a bad package of goods. So this is a really funny example. Um, so the quote from, it's an abridged quote from the Times that a Sri Lankan news portal put out. And it says, uh, Sri Lanka has everything to offer perfect holiday. I think they meant a perfect holiday. Um, and then the full quote is completely different. It says, Sri Lanka has the hotels, the food, the climate, and the charm to offer the perfect holiday. It's just a pity about the increasingly despotic government. <laughs> so like, if you heard that quote, you probably wouldn't want a vacation there. So again, that's taking things too out of context, you want to manipulate the, the context to fit your purposes, right, and to make everything seem smooth, but you don't want to misrepresent yourself. 
It's not politics, you know? And worse, you just don't want to ignore it so that everybody's confused once they get to the end on why you took a certain route. Right. So context in designer-client relationships. Jen and I like to say that dealing with clients is just like dating. And it kind of is. Like, well, and we're looking at this from a woman's perspective. So you have to be friendly, and you have to be sweet, and you have to be pretty and, and nice, and, like, and you have to gently lead so that they think it was their idea to go see the Katherine Heigl movie. Um, it's just like you have to be sweet, but then you have to lay down the law. Like if they get too handsy, you have to say no. Like you have to know your barriers, right? And you have to meet in the middle, but you also have to lay down the law. So it's totally similar also, like context, in that like when you meet somebody and you're like, oh, they're so funny and they're so cool and he's so cute and whatever. And then like after two dates, he's the worst guy in the world, you know? Um, or like maybe you thought he was really boring and then like you hang out with him for a while and you realize he's really cool. And what changed? They didn't change. Just you were given more information to define the context um, and, and put this guy in perspective. So basically, we're going to give you a couple of horror stories. So Jen dated this one guy. <laughs> So we this is scary, isn't it? No, none of you want to date us anymore. <laughs> You're like, I don't want to be on the next slideshow. Oh my gosh. No, we kind of, yeah. Anyways, so case number one, or 743 in this case. We haven't dated this much. It was just more exciting to put 743. Um, the bad boy. So I was at this party of my friends, and I'm talking to this guy, and he's like really funny, and we're having a good time. And my friend walks over to me, and she's like, be careful, he's a bad boy. I'm like, what is wrong with that? Steve McQueen, he's a good bad boy. I'm thinking maybe he'll um, be like John McClane. By the way, next giveaway, who is the villain in the first Die Hard movie? First to shout it out. Oh, yeah, he, he said it. the last name. I th <laughs> okay. okay, you and whoever. Yes. Rocky. Rocky. Okay. Come, up, come up later, we'll give you t-shirts. Um, I thought, cool, it'd be like dating John McClane, right? Like bad boy, that's exciting. So we scheduled the first date. He comes, he picks me up in his truck. And as we're pulling away from the car, uh, from my house, he, I realized that there's like this retrofitted um, cooler in the front of the truck. And like he's drinking one and there's empties in the floorboard and he's offering me one Brody's. while we're driving. And I'm like, this isn't real, is it? But I'm like, okay, let's just see where this goes. Because <laughs> so, it was just too funny. I, I, couldn't even, I couldn't even like put into words like how weird this was. So then I like look behind me because like in that like limo window that some trucks have into the back and there was a mattress there. And that was scary. I was like, does he live here or does he think that something's going to happen later? I don't know. Um, but the last straw was on the way to dinner. He was telling me that he makes a living making barrettes, like hair barrettes, you know, like for ladies, like from the 80s. And he like sells them at this local like folk art thing. And then he like proceeded to take one out and try and put my hair into one. And then he told me my hair was nappy. So I was just like, this sucks. Never tell a woman her hair is yeah. nappy, OK? So, so my expectations were like way wrong because I didn't take enough time to like contextualize him before I made that jump into the car alone. So, um, She's still here to talk about it, though. Yeah, good news. I faked an illness and went home immediately. <laughs> and it was a good, it's a good story now, as you know. And that's pretty much my reaction was as if. But um, case number two. Is, is Amy's personal story. So case number two, uh, the environmentally conscious surfer and sailor. Okay, so we met this guy, like, you know how you can rent the boats out here? Some of you guys have done it. So they have these things called Duffy boats in Newport, and we, we always like to go out with our girlfriends, bring like 20 bottles of champagne, and go out on these Duffy boats. So the guy running the Duffy boats, it, he's like, it's like his in-between job, and he just got back like sailing around the world, like saving the earth, taking ecological samples with scientists, and, and he seems so great, right? He lived on a boat. That was so cool, right? He looked like Thor's brother. He was like blonde and like blue eyed and like big. He wore a lot like, of metal. Yeah, he was, and he <laughs> surfed. He didn't wear a lot of metal. He did not wear a lot of metal. I think that's against an environmental code or something yeah. to wear metal. But yeah, like he was a surfer and he was like, he cared about something. He was passionate, right? So we go on a date and like no more than like five minutes into our first beer, he starts going off on how the government is brainwashing us like the Nazis did by putting fluoride in the water. And I'm like, do you always talk about Hitler on your first dates? And he was like, he just stopped long enough to be like, hey, I'm annoyed that you're breaking out my train of thought. But then he just kept going. <laughs> so it was just too much. I mean, I love Mother Earth, like, yay, I don't want to like kill the dolphins or anything. But um, it, was so, it was so aggressive and it was so much right off the bat. And then the last straw, 
was he kept sending me reggae on Spotify. And I was like, <laughs> I just can't do it anymore. And well, like Bob Marley here and there. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. then he would like text me when Mercury was rising, and I was like, too much. Yeah. So. <laughs> so again, like you gotta take the time to get to know someone so that you can appreciate those weird things and not be like thrown off, you know? Yeah, so I, I, same thing with clients. Yeah, I jumped in and I thought, oh, he's really cool. Like that client, like, oh, they're so cool. And like, oh my gosh, their idea is so cool. And then you get into it and you're like, hey, they're unprepared. They haven't thought any of it out. Like, you, you know, you gotta, do the, you gotta do the recon. Yeah, and this is our last example, just cause it's funny. This one's the best. Um, <laughs> so I, I made a guy at a concert and he's really good looking. He has like those really big eyebrows like Colin Farrell. <laughs> and, which for some reason it does work. It does work. And uh, we're talking about music and then he tells me he's a professor. So I'm like, cool. This might be like dating like Indiana Jones. And he likes music too. That's exciting. So he gets my number. We schedule the date and we're at this restaurant. And um, I'm trying to tell him something stupid about my childhood because that's what you do when you're nervous. And then... <laughs> Uh, this baby is like screaming and wailing and melting down the, next to us and he's like excuse me just a minute and he does this like you're the baby he does this <laughs> towards the baby and <laughs> I no joke this no is joke. real this is real and the baby stopped crying that was the weird thing and I was like what just happened and he was like oh I'm a warlock and <laughs> <laughs> And this was one of those moments where my, my expectations were like, all of a sudden I was like, this is even cooler. Like, I'm no. dating Harry Potter meets like Indiana Jones. And, but then it got a little weird because it turned out like, he taught at Texas, um, Univers or University of Texas Austin, and his professorship was, he was an expert at torture. And I was like, I don't know if you want someone with a God complex who knows how to like, conjure spirits to like, know how to torture you in every way either. So. <laughs> We remained super good friends. He lived in Texas, so it was more just like a fun date anyways. But that was actually like, I was actually more excited after the date, getting more context than going into it. That was pretty, that was pretty fun. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I dated two warlocks, by the way, on accident. I didn't even know. So I'm putting out some vibe, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, but basically, um, what we're saying is there's all kinds of clients out there, right? And um, there are clients who are super hands-on, there are clients who can't make a decision to save their life, there's clients with God complexes. Um, you just have to open up your ears and listen, though. You can't jump in and think you know without getting all the information. So you kind of have to play Sherlock Holmes, is what we like to say. You have to look for those context cues and clues as to what kind of people that you're dealing with, and then that's how you figure out how to meet them where they're at. And um, that's how you anticipate problems, and that's how you do your best communication. Um, it's not one size fit all with clients, right? Like if you try and do the same routine, like kind of like how manage your, like I think Ryan Carson was talking about, like, oh, this is how we do work with clients. Like you have to do A, B, and C, everything's through email, like whatever it is, if there's too much constraints, you're, you're missing the opportunity to work with them at their best. So um, yeah, you gotta meet in the middle. It's just like dating, you gotta meet in the middle. You gotta give as much as you can and try and teach as much as you can. And then sometimes you have to choose your battles and sometimes you have to sever the tie. So you just have to kind of know and look for those things. And this isn't a one-way street either. Um, you can control the context of who you are. Um, you can contextualize yourself. And we do this in dating. We put what we want people to know about us on Facebook. Um, we're controlling what people think about us. Like my Instagram is perfectly curated. That's not really me. That's way more exciting than me. Um, but I want people to think that my life is really exciting. <laughs> so I post the good stuff. But you can do that with clients by understanding where they're coming from and trying to like find some sort of common bond between you and them. You're not pretending to be something you're not. You're just trying to find it, something that connects you as humans. Because at the end of the day, I mean, this is a very emotional field design. It's very subjective. Um, what you personally feel about a project, a client's going to feel something different. And you're really not dealing on black and white. You're just dealing on what emotions people are feeling about it. So if you can try and control the context of yourself as a nice person who they trust, who seems professional, who has always led them through and given them good reasons why they're doing everything, they're gonna be more likely to trust you because of that context you've painted for them. And they're gonna be more likely to, to kind of give you the, the reins. And, and that's good because you never want your client to not trust you and suddenly lose faith and try and take control over your project because they're gonna have bad feelings and they're gonna start injecting just pointless decisions upon the process just, just to get something done because they don't think that you're capable. 
Yeah, and yeah. people, they, I, there's like some statistic that like 70% of buying decisions are made off of just emotion. So people are emotional people, and until like robots take over, like the Google cars or something, like we have to, we have to account for that, and you have to try and meet people where they're at. So control context from the captain's seat. Um, set yourself up from the beginning as the expert. Like, you know, find the common ground. Um, if you're at a company, like, show your boss that you're going the extra mile. Um, try and pretend, or not pretend, that was so bad. Try and let them know that you care about the project as much as they do. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, if you make promises and statements, you gotta follow through. You can't just say one thing at the beginning, like, we're gonna do all this stuff for you to sign the contract, and then change it in the end, and, and they're just gonna be disappointed. So you gotta control the project. And this is really obvious, but like shout out to Envision and Ben. We use Envision and um, our clients, they're kind of, they're not designers. That's why they hired us, right? So we like to contextualize our work as much as possible. And that's not just for them, that's for us too. Um, like if I'm doing a logo, inevitably the one that's my favorite at the beginning is completely different once I try and like mock it up in real life scenarios like on a menu or like in a, in a window on vinyl or something. Um, so it's good for us too, but being able to have them like walk through the website before it's coded and make those decisions, um, it just helps them really contextualize how this thing's going to happen instead of just like this flat plate, this flat thing. So to end our speech, we're going to give you some Sherlock Holmes tips on how to avoid being context clueless. So don't be fooled by face value. Um, whatever someone presents to you, that's what they think they are, and um, some of it is true, but you're also going to pick up on things that you realize about them by reading in between the lines. And you don't have to tell them those things about them, but it'll just help you to know how to communicate to them better, um, how to deal with them on projects better, um, if they like to be called more than, you get better feedback when you call them to go over things than when you just email them, um, things like that. So always do your due diligence to try and test what they're saying or what they're projecting. Dig into the details and find out really everything you can about them, the project, everything. Um, trusting what they say on face value, it's not like they're trying to mislead you, but they just have a different perception and you might know more based on doing the research yourself. This one's good. So just listen, interpret, confirm, and kick ass. Or lick. <laughs> easy to easy remember to remember. acronym, yeah. <laughs> and lastly, or almost lastly, read your audience. Um, like, people are like, oh, I myself, and like, uh, F you, and like, take me or leave me. It's like, you know, those girls write that on, or they post a thing on Instagram, like, if you can't take me at my best, then you don't deserve me at my worst, or I don't know what it is, but uh, <laughs> red flags for you guys on those girls. But um, read your audience and try and meet them where they're at. Like, if you're pitching a surf company, you're probably not going to show up in a suit and tie, you know? If you're pitching, like, some mortgage guy on Fifth Avenue, you probably are. So, yeah, read your audience. And the human element just trumps everything. Being able to contextualize the person you're working with will tell you so much more about your project than any brief they put together ever could. So learning about them, um, their goals, who they are, what they want, um, the people around them that are going to be working with you on the project, that's just so huge. Don't just say stay insular. Um, really plug yourself into the people involved because that's really where the project is springing from and they're the ones who are going to approve or not approve what you make. So, Till the robots take over. Yeah. Josh and Share forever! <laughs> Clueless reference. I don't know. <laughs> Wasn't Paul Rudd at his best at that point? Yeah. You know? So um, baby signing. And we do have t-shirts if you guys want one, but we're too poor to give them away. So they're $25. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>um, so, you obviously, you, you kind of spoke from your client background and a lot of this stuff about contextualizing has, you know, it has to do with you entering a project or like, so there is all this context. I'd be interesting to hear what your thoughts on, are on, you know, if you had to start something new. I know that you guys mostly do client work, but what if there was like, uh, there's obviously always some context, but if it was like a blank or new project or you're trying to build some, a completely new product, like what's, how do you contextualize something that you're just starting up? There's no client. The client is you, maybe. Right. Do you, do you have you some ideas on that? Just go to bars and talk to everybody about it while you're drunk, I think. That's where you get the most like, honest feedback, you know? Don't talk to your parents about it because um, they won't tell you anything real. Your friends won't either if they are sober. But maybe if you talk to them drunk, they would tell you realistically some like market research about your idea before 
you actually do it? But I think there's also enough out there, like nothing's new, right? There's no new ideas. Like I think there's enough out there that even if you're not making like the same thing, there's something you can learn from all the things that have been done. So like looking at like the different projects that are similar or, or like maybe doing things that you kind of want to do but differently, um, I think you can always find context. It's, you just have to, you know, look. Okay, cool. So get drunk and, and look yeah. at other people's work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool, thanks. Very easy answer. Any other questions? Yeah, awesome presentation. What do you think makes you guys different than other similar, smaller agencies? What's your differentiator? Um, well, kind of like Ryan was talking about, we work four, hour, or four day weeks too, and uh, we come in at 10. Um, half our people work from home too. Um, and we, like, even like Kim was saying, like, we're just working to make a living, and we love what we do, so it is really fun. Um, but, you know, we try to pick projects that we are excited about, so that we want to work on them when we're there. But we also, we want to go home, and we want to turn off, and we want to have our side projects, and we want to just live life. Um, I don't know. I don't but know what's if that different, makes us different. What do you think is different about our style, maybe? I don't know. Oh, um, well, we were artists first. Like, I was a painter, and Jen did, like, you know, illustration and stuff. And I think that makes a difference because uh, we look at something from a completely different perspective um, than just, I don't know, maybe going direct to computer. Um, but a lot of people sketch, but I think that does make a pretty big difference. Um, thinking about, like, hey, maybe we don't even have to do anything with pixels. What if we do something, I don't know. With paint or something. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's good to have that in your utility belt. Great work, by the way. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about, or there was another talk about uh, designer tools, right? Um, what are you guys' tools? Like when you guys start new projects and, you know. Well, we don't do, like, you guys are all mostly, like, like web heavy, right? So we do a lot of branding. So, like, logos and, um, you know, maybe we're doing, like I said, like if you're doing a restaurant, menus and, like, vinyl for stuff like that. So um, we do a lot of sketching, just the old-fashioned way. Um, sketch it out, you know, get our ideas out. Um, <sighs> Jen's really quippy, so I always make Jen come up with quippy taglines, and like we try and think of something really interesting that maybe the client didn't think about that we can pitch. The yeah, um, our tools are definitely just pen and paper. Yeah, pen and paper, <laughs> and then you know, like the Adobe Creative Suite, Illustrator, yeah. and <clears throat> InDesign, and um, all that kind of stuff. But we don't use anything super fancy, honestly. Envision's the fanciest thing we use <laughs> um, to like help the clients out, but the rest is just a Creative Suite. But we will be on hoarders one day because we never know, know what to do with like all the sketches. Like they're too close to your heart to like throw away, you know? So there's just like piles and piles and piles of discarded sketches that no longer really need to be kept, but they're like children, you can't really throw them out. So, I don't know. I have a question. What were some of the powers that the Warlock said he had? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well it's weird because the minute you ask them for something concrete, like suddenly they don't have that power, you know? <laughs> so you're like, that was, so it might, I don't know, yeah. And they always oscillate between what they think they know or can do, so I can never really tell, you know? And every time I've asked them to do something specific, they're like, no, you can't do that because of, then they try and explain it in some scientific way that I never understand, so I don't know. Gotcha. Limited powers then. Yeah. <laughs> Limited powers. Convenient powers. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? All right. Thanks, ladies. Thanks. <laughs> yeah.